Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm really looking forward to the discussion we're gonna have today. So let's get into our first question. So you all focus on girls' education, both as a part of your work and beyond it as advocates. So could you share why you have chosen to concentrate your efforts on girls' education specifically? Um, Vivian, why don't we start with you first? Thank you so much, Amanda. I'm so excited to be part of this year's Gallup Summit. Um, so the reason why uh, I'm really passionate about it, girls' education, first of all, it's the right investment uh, that we need to have in our societies but also just um, as a person, right? Uh, I've been very fortunate um, to have access to quality and safe education that has empowered me, given me a voice. And um, just a little bit about my background. I was raised by a single mom. I came from a community that did not appreciate girls' education. And for me, for the longest, going to school was proving that educating a girl is just as important as educating a boy child, right? And having come out of my community and seen how education has transformed my life, and then had the opportunity to travel vastly across the continent uh, of Africa, uh, interacted with the young girls. And everywhere I go, the first question when I meet the young girls in the community, they tell me they want to go to school, they want to have an education so that they can become teachers, so that they can provide for their parents, so that they can become better people in the society. And I'm a living example of somebody whose life has really been transformed for the best through access to quality education. That's why I've really devoted my efforts and my voice to uh, to advocate for girls' education, but also engage government leaders, um, private sector leaders, multilateral leaders to prioritize investment in girls' education because it's the right thing to do. I mean, we continue to justify why we need to invest in girls' education, but the bare minimum, it's the right thing to do. It's the best investment to transform our communities. Yeah, I absolutely love that. I love how you based it on your own personal experiences. And because you've gone through this, you've also like brought it to other girls that um, also need to gain access to quality girls education. So I really love that you mentioned that, Vivian. Um, Hasna, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that was a very interesting story. Like, it's so interesting to hear because it sounds so similar, not necessarily to my story, but, you know, we've met so many girls who have similar stories, who have similar dreams. Um, in short, I'm just going to say is this girl, her name is Pualu. She wants to be a medical doctor, but unfortunately had her died when she was 13 and her mom is a petty who could no longer afford to send her to school. And so she had to drop out. And uh, she gave up on her dream. So she heard of one of our educational programs, Ace Radio School Listening Center. And what we do at this listening center is we gather children, out of school children, and they listen to audio educational lessons on literacy, numeracy, and science through a speaker. When she heard about this program, she was so excited because it was like a second chance for her education. It was a second chance for her to dream again. So um, I'll say, to, with, to answer your question, we focus on girls' education because of girls like Palu, because of girls like Mariam, who I've met, who has to help her mother sell peanuts. And she watches in envy as other children go to school. So we're focusing on girls. We're doing this because of the millions of girls who are nearby and far away, those who we see and those who are hidden away somewhere. And they, they are unable to dream. They are too scared to dream because they have been denied the opportunity to learn to read and write. Um, I don't know if you know this, but Nigeria has the highest number of out of school children in the world, the highest number of out of school children. About 18 million children are currently out of school and 60% of them are girls. So for us, for girls like Pualu and millions more, we need to focus on girls' education. Like she mentioned, it is the right thing to do. Yeah, so just like connecting that to what Vivian said, it's the bare minimum, you know. So, Saf, Sadaf, or um, Fresha, do you guys want to add anything? Okay. Yes, sure. Uh, I'm working, I have chosen to work for girls' uh, rights because I'm the one whose rights has been violated in Afghanistan. As you all know, the girls are banned from going to school in Afghanistan. That's why today I've chosen to uh work for girls uh, rights here uh, and I could relate to this topic the most that's why that I've chosen to work for them and speak out my words and millions of girls who are living here and are banned from going to school that's why that I have uh, chosen 
this topic to uh, put my effort on. And so, yeah, I'm here for that. Yeah, so I love, you know, I know about everything that's currently going on and it's really inspiring to see that um, you're stepping forward to really do something about that. Um, Freshta, I know you're also from Afghanistan. Is there anything you want to add? Yes, Amanda, thank you. I think I uh, have started focusing more on girls' education. I have worked for a long time for both children, girls and boys, but now more specifically for girls' education because it's, it's people like Sadaf that we need to support because their education has been banned by the state. And it's not the first time in Afghanistan, 20 years before the state um, had officially banned girls' education. And, and because, because it's happening through state, it's very different probably from Nigeria case or other countries cases where there could be many different reasons, but directly the state is not banning it. And when a state bans girls' education and sending really strong um, signals to citizens that they're not equal. And I think when, 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 a, when a powerful group of people, which is the state and regulates people's life, bans it, it's, it makes, it makes it absolutely a, a different case, a very challenging case, a very challenging fight for every one of us. So I'm, I'm, I'm working for this. So people like Sadaf and her generation gets the right to quality education and access to education. Yeah, definitely. So seeing the importance of quality education, how would you describe the current state of girls' education, particularly for adolescent girls' education? Um, could you guys speak to the progress as well as the challenges? Hasana, do you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, I'll speak to the progress first. One of the big, pro one of the main um, good news, or one of the good news is that many parents want to send their children to school. There's increased interest, you know, before um, many parents did not want to send their daughters to school, you know, they didn't see the need to send their daughters to school. But now parents want to send their daughters to school. Um, for our program, the East Radio School, I mentioned earlier, what we, what we do is we teach um, using the local language, right? And so this means that parents can listen to the educational content along with their children. So they are hearing the children say ABC, they are hearing the children sing alphabet songs. So they know there is no religious or westernized propaganda. You know? So because of that, they are supportive of Western education. We get calls every day from parents who are so grateful for you know, the fact that you know, um, their children are able to learn. The issue or one of the challenges is the quality of education is so poor that parents are, start to, are starting to see it as a waste of time and money. For example, um, there's this boy, I'll speak of a boy. He's one of our beneficiaries. His name is Bashir. And his dad bought him a pencil to enroll in our listening center. He bought him a pencil. Now that pencil is a symbol of support. And Bashir has never been to school. We asked his dad why. And his dad said, because if I send my son to school, to the government school, there's no teaching going on. All the, the children do is play. And I can't afford private schools. So because of that, he wouldn't send his child to a formal school. This is what parents of girls are saying. They're saying, why should I send my daughter to a government school, which that's what they can afford, and then they're not doing anything. So what they do now is they feel their daughters should rather be invested in other things that they see as more productive, like hawking, like going to the farm, like helping in the stores or in the markets, those they see as more productive, or like even getting married. They might see it as, instead of her, going to school and then playing, let's just marry her off, you know? So that's one of the challenges. We have a um, low number of teachers. We have uh, outdated curriculum, you know, all these factors are contributing to the poor quality of education. And then another challenge is the fact that the education is not necessarily free. Speaking of progress, it is free for nine months, nine years, the first nine years of education is free legally, right? But unfortunately, if 
they are unable to afford the exam fees or sports fees or furniture fees, they are sent back home. This means it's not really free. It's not completely free. And then for the last three years of education, that's last three years of secondary school, parents have to pay for their children to go to school, for their daughters to go to school. And because of that, because meal education might be more prioritized, if parents have to pay, they will not pay for their girls to go to school. This, we, have, we have actually seen a sharp, dramatic drop in the rate of school enrollments when it comes to senior secondary schools. And what happens is once uh, they drop out, the next thing is to get them married off. No, know? yeah. Hassan, I totally get that. And I really liked how you talked about how there are definitely challenges that come with it, like less access to resources and how people just turn to other alternatives, such as marrying their child off instead of focusing on quality education. Um, Freshja and Sadaf, you guys, based on your experience in Afghanistan, um, how is the progress going for you guys? Uh, I want to talk about the progress. Uh, I would say that... Uh, if you if you decide to go uh, if you decide to stay in Afghanistan and um, like enroll your child to a, to a government school in Afghanistan, you will uh, be aware of uh, like you can't be sure for her future uh, when you want to uh, enroll your daughter to a government school or any other school in Afghanistan. You you can't be aware of uh, the continuation the continuation continuation of uh, her education and you can't be sure if she can go to school and she can continue to her studies continuously and this is the exact thing what we all face in Afghanistan uh, my parents enrolled me in a school and uh, the, the, it, everything is uh, based on hope we all hope that girls and uh, everybody if they decide to uh, send their ch children to school they just um, hope for the future. They're not. Uh, um, they're not sure what will happen to us in the future. Um, like, uh, I want to give an example of mine. Uh, my parents have enrolled me to a school, and they were all hoping the best that I'm gonna. Um, I'm gonna graduate, or uh, I'll. Or a bright future is waiting for me. Uh, but suddenly, Taliban came, and they just banned us from going to school and we're all just forced to stay home. And this is what happened to us. Uh, nobody's sure what will happen to their children uh, after going to school. Um, we're all depressed here. Uh, I'm, I'm just um, thinking of what if the other, the, the next generation, um, they just decide not to send their children to school just because um, well, the, the experience, the, the situation that we are living here, uh, what if, what if they say, uh, if I send my children to, if I send my child to school, uh, what if the government take over and the other power came on and what will, uh, what will happen to my ch child if they suddenly, uh, uh, force my child to stay home and not go to, uh, school anymore what will happen to her uh, and this is what i'm thinking about and i'm just kind of sure it will happen to the next generation if the next generation's parents they decide themselves not to send their children to school just because um, the security problems and their their children's safety uh, their health mental health and stuff like that I'm just thinking about that. Uh, I feel sorry for the girls who are banned uh, from going to school in Afghanistan. You know, this is something that personally affects you. And just hearing you talk about the restrictions on girls specifically, it's really heartbreaking. Um, so Freshta, what would you like to add about that? I think, first of all, I'd say that um, what our girls are asking back in Afghanistan is a valid question. But but they must be knowing that they hold certain level of power. They, they hold the power to change their lives in, in the capacities that they are currently. And I think Sadaf is an example of that. She's talking about this, she's demanding the change. Um, my generation, all of us, 
even if we are outside of Afghanistan and we have left the country for security reasons, every day and night we are working. And I think many other girls who are not Afghans across the world are showing their solidarity. And these all are giving me personally hope that we are going to change the situation. Afghanistan faced this similar ban in 1929 for the first time for nine, nine months. Then in 1996 to 2001 for the first time when Taliban came and now it is second time. So we have seen this before. And last time when I was a child, this happened. I was two, three years old and Taliban came. And there were many secret schools. People started studying at home and people advocated and we changed the situation. My, I think my, my biggest um, message is that we're going to get, get out of this. We have had a lot of achievements, just quickly on achievements. In 2001, only 100,000 children were going to school because Taliban had, had banned the country. The country was going through war. But in 1920, last year, this time, 10 million children were going to school and 39% and of them were girls. We had girls representing Afghanistan in international competitions. Sadaf herself had participated in mathematics competition and got second prize across the world. So there were so many achievements that we had. This is, this is, a, this is a very difficult time, but we will get through this. Yeah, that was, wow, that was inspiring, Freshda. You and Sadaf are just both girl bosses. I just want to say that. Um, Vivian, I also know that you do a lot of work um, in improving girls' education, as you mentioned before. So what is the current state of that for you? And could you also speak to the progress as well as the challenges? First of all, I would like to thank my fellow panelists for sharing their stories. Um, I mean, I'm, it's very heartbreaking to hear what's happening in Afghanistan. And thank you again, Sadat, uh, for sharing your story in a very authentic way. Um, it inspires us, but also motivates us to know that the work is not yet done and we have to continue amplifying um, the voices of girls like yourself and many other girls in Afghanistan and in war-torn countries across the world that demand access to education so that they can take charge of their lives. So going back, um, so a lot has been shared by the other panelists, but I also want to, um, something that I've really um, noticed in my country, but also across the continent traveling, is the interest of the local leaders uh, pushing for girls' education. And for me, I've always said that if it doesn't start from the ground, there's no way it's going to be sustainable and there's no way uh, it's going to be long lasting. And that's very important when it comes to girls' education, because when you're thinking about empowering a girl, you're not only empowering one person, you're empowering the community that she comes from. And when you're going to educate that girl, you just get a brutal from a community, right? You need to educate the community where she's coming from, why it's important to educate girls, why it's important to empower girls and how they can become change agents in their own communities. And now the, the fact that I'm seeing a lot of local leaders, the chiefs um, coming out to support girls education, I think for me, it's very inspiring and very motivating because then I know that the change is coming from the ground. And if it comes from the ground, then it's a sustainable change that will be able to have ripple effects in the many coming years. But again, uh, there are other issues that we need to address when it comes to MHM, um, menstrual hygiene management. Many girls drop out of school when they get to their adolescent age. And that's because they don't have just a toilet where they can be able to freely change their sanitary pads in a dignified way. And majority of the girls don't even have sanitary towels. Um, if you look at many countries even across the continent, sanitary towels are still taxed at a very high percentage. When uh, menstruation is a biological cycle that no girl, no woman has control over. I mean, it's a passage that we all have to go through. So why would you tax, uh, I mean, a biological cycle, right? So the fact that sanitary towels are still being taxed very highly, most girls are forced to drop out of school um, to be able to sometimes work so that they can be able to buy sanitary towels or just never go back to school as a result of a biological cycle. So that's very uh, demotivating when it comes to girls' education. And also COVID-19 has really impacted girls' education. My many girls, I mean, the progress that we've, we've had pre-COVID um, has sort of like been taken back um, a couple steps uh, as a result of the impacts of COVID-19. The teenage pregnancies have gone literally exponentially high. And then 
uh, girls' marriage um, has also gone high, um, and also girls dropping out of school to be able to support their families. Um, so they're supposed to work to put food on the table because their parents lost their jobs or um, they lost their parents as a result of that. So technically they become the, the next caregivers uh, and as a result, the burden put on the younger. So I've seen a lot of that. The statistics are out to support that. But again, um, I'm seeing there's a renewed momentum. We have the Transform Education Summit happening in September, and there's a lot of conversations around girls' education, but conversations alone are not enough. We also need investment in girls' education. So we need to see countries uh, increasing their domestic allocation funds to girls' education. We need to see the multilateral, the private sector coming on board um, for us to ensure that it's not just a conversation, but it's also a reality on the ground. And also supporting countries like Afghanistan, where girls are being denied access to education. Um, I mean, if we put pressure on Afghanistan government, we'll be able to get girls, in, girls back in school. And that's why what Fresher say that they, 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 there's, there's some light, uh, but it's just gonna take us time for us to see that light. And the only way we can be able to see light for the girls in Afghanistan and the girls in Ukraine and all these countries that are impacted by war uh, is through putting pressure, but also continuing to stay in sol solidarity and advocating for girls' education. And also to the girls, Gallup youth leaders, I think this is the time for you to raise your voices for girls' education. Learn from each other, collaborate, exchange information and knowledge, exchange tools on social media on how you can be able to share your share uh, share your work, share your uh, your message, but also rally one another because it's only in our collective voices that we can be able to bring changes to our community, but also bring the attention of the globe, uh, the, the global community to girls education and also girls education in top, uh, war -torn, uh areas such as Afghanistan. And, you know, it's so impactful to hear all of your perspectives and just seeing you shine a positive light, especially when striving for change for young girls. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, for hopping on this panel to speak about the importance of girls' education. I absolutely love speaking to all of you. It was so, so powerful. And I really love what you guys are doing. Continue doing that. It's absolutely amazing. And I know so many girls would be inspired after hearing this. So, yeah, thank you guys so much for just being here today. and. Um, speaking about your experiences and the advice that you have for other young girls. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much for having us.